Thank you for having me and thanks for the introduction. So just as a quick intro to, to myself, just so you can see where my perspective's coming from, I think I'm going to repeat a lot of what's been said, which is probably a good thing because it seems there's a few themes coming out. Um, I'm Dr. Marilyn Lennon. I'm resident here in Strathclyde, as Claire said. I'm actually the director of something called the Digital Health and Wellness Research Group. Um, we're based in computing science, but we're very multidisciplinary. We have lots of social scientists in there, psychologists. Um, and what we look at is how technology can help improve people's lifestyles, which is very sort of wide reaching. So it has a lot to do with the future cities work that Ewan referred to. Um, but anything that technology can do to help people's lifestyles. The reason I sort of point that out is because my background is part psychologist, part computing scientist. So psychologists refer to me as the techie person or the technologist, and the techie people refer to me as the resident psychologist. And I think that's important because a few people, both Claire and Ewan, have mentioned uh, being citizen-led and user-centered. And what is at the key of our technology development for smart homes, for smart meters, for anything to do with health and wellness, is to start with the user or the patient or the consumer and ask them what they want in their life to improve it and then look at the technology. So that's really key for our research. So talking about behaviour change and smarter choices, which is a really key theme to this idea of the smart energy rollout. I don't really need to, to, to dwell on this, but basically cities are getting bigger and bigger, lots more people, especially older adults. So a lot of my research is motivated in the fact that I'd like to support older adults at home. So a lot of my work looks at smart home technology, which is definitely not a new thing. It's been around for at least 20 years. What worries me as an academic is that we're talking about smart home technology and we keep talking about it and we keep talking about it. But as Ewan kind of said, it's not necessarily now commonplace in our homes that it's all instrumented with this smart technology. Um, I mean, some of us have managed to do that, but there are lots of reasons why we don't necessarily want to just fling all the technology in and then wait to see what happens. And I think the same is true with smart meters. Let's have a show of hands. This might be a really bad experiment, but who already has a smart meter in their home? Let's test the... Okay, so a, a good handful. Who actually uses it? So I'm really embarrassed to say that I don't use it. And as a technologist and as somebody that promotes smart technology, that's really bad. And I actually spend a lot of time reflecting on myself to say why am I not using that. And I'm going to suggest a few reasons why I might not be in a second and what we can do about that. So one of the things we can do to try and reduce this burden on our hospitals and um, on the, the dentist appointments and on the energy that we're consuming with this many people consuming all those resources is we can start to look at helping people to understand their own behaviours and try and help them with technology to improve it. So the Fitbit is the perfect example that everybody comes up with. Um, Fitbit could potentially make us walk more run more, cycle more to make us healthier. Smart meters potentially, if done correctly, could help us to understand our energy consumption behaviours. What I think is really worth mentioning, although I'm a techie person, I love really advanced technology, but I think the key to this is to um, harness the consumer technologies that are already out there. So to make the, the information available to me via my smartphone or my TV or something that looks familiar to me, like a tablet. So some of the smart meters we see now are really looking like a smartphone, and people tend to embrace that much more than something that looks um, overly technical in their home. I think it's really important to start to provide incentives. So I love that you mentioned gamification. In, in computing science, we love that term, partly because it sounds really cool and really techy, but actually because gamification is the one thing that I think does look at behaviour change in a really interesting way. It takes something that we all tend to relate to, competition, games, and it actually understands what our intentions and our beliefs are. So for example, it works perfectly um, in the health context. I have a walk, who's, who's got walking apps? So I have one, I don't use it independently because I'm not interested enough in my health, which is really bad. However, my husband has a walking app and because I'm really competitive, I walk more each day so that I can make sure I get more steps than my husband. So for some people, gamification, competition works. And I wonder if there's something we could unlock in the energy market with that. As Ewan said, we could have communities uh, competing together, playing against each other, 
um, neighbourhoods um, going for prizes, for example, or incentives, and that's something the government probably needs to look at as well. So I've mentioned understanding behaviour or behaviour change a few times. One of my big bugbears is that people talk about behaviour change and throw it into all the conversations. So all the conferences I go to, um, people say, oh, we're, doing, we're looking at behaviour change. Um, we've implemented a behaviour change theory. If you actually look at what people are doing in behaviour change, not a lot of people have nailed it. And I, I don't mean to be overly negative. I still think this is the key to unlocking some of this. But I think we need to think about how to do it correctly. So what I think we need to do is, is to really understand what people's intentions are and to understand what is it that helps me make a decision about whether to turn the straighteners on 10 minutes before or to use the tumble dryer excessively. What are my decision-making processes and how could the smart meter and the display help to affect the decision I make about those behaviours? The link between what we know and what we believe and what we actually end up doing is not necessarily always correlated. So if you ask me, would you pick a cookie or an apple? I'll say, well, definitely the apple. It's Monday. I should definitely have an apple. I had a really big weekend. When you actually give me the apple and the cookie, I'll take the cookie. So my belief and my intention are not always correlated to the action. Something I think that the technical bit is going to be really useful for is to actually um, do the sensing bit. So you and again, I think mentioned big data or data science and everybody, especially the researchers are having a, a great time hypothesizing what they can do with all the data that our cities are going to be soaking up. If we have sensors on buses and we have sensors on our body, we can take all that data and we can start to understand people's behaviors better, but we do need lots and lots and lots of that data. What we can do in the home is we can instrument things like our kettles and our, our hair straighteners and tumble dryers and start to understand that and start to collect that data. The last one here for me is a sort of usability scientist is, uh, is really, really key. I think the thing that we're doing badly collectively is to actually look at how we're presenting this information back to people. So I think we've started to get the big data and we're thinking, wow, we can do awesome stuff with the data, but I don't think we've nailed how to present it back. And I'll show you an example of what I mean by that. Just before I do that, I think it's worth showing, I'm not going to go into a complicated theory or a complicated model, but something that's been used in the health research quite a lot is this trans-theoretical model of behaviour change. Now, it sounds very grand, but essentially all I want to let you know is that these are the stages that each of us go through just naturally when we're trying to make a decision about whether to take action on turning the tumble dryer off or taking 10,000 steps a day. And there's plenty of opportunity for us to relapse into not sustaining a sensible or a healthy behaviour choice or a smart behaviour. And I think we need to look at how the smart meters can support people maintaining smart choices and smart behaviours. So it's taken me quite a bit to get to technology considering I'm a technologist. But as I said before, I think the technology has nailed the part where you can start to sense stuff. So we can look at things like our usage patterns when we're using um, technology in the home. I'm not going to go into this in detail. This is actually a colleague at Strathclyde. Do, they, do we have these colleagues in the audience before I... No, we don't. Okay, I just wanted to advertise this because it's a really good example of a usage study. What I think people haven't done so far, and we need to do more of this, is to do longitudinal studies. So a lot of people have put smart meters in for health into the home and said that they've started to notice behaviour change but they've done a six-week study. And quite often, the technology is so novel that, of course, I'm going to change my behaviour. I'm going to take more steps or turn the, the kettle off more readily if it's for six weeks. What we need is these two-year longitudinal studies to really understand behaviour change. And you can access the paper. You can ask me for details afterwards. If I just click through to this example, as a computing scientist, I love bar charts, line graphs. Absolutely amazing. But what I, I do know for a fact is my mum, my sister, um, my friends, they don't want to see this for energy usage. They want to see something much more compelling, much more interesting. And the people who I think might have nailed this is the gamification people, as Ewan said. So a better example might be something like this. Now, this is a really old technology, as you can tell from the phone. But this is something that's called persuasive technology. And in the health sector, what's been happening is they're trying to gamify or at least make more interesting the display. So in this case... Um, your friends and family each have a garden and your energy consumption, in this case it's steps, but you could 
um, relate your energy consumption to the health of the garden, so flowers die and butterflies come in and that kind of thing. Now, that sounds really simple and flippant, but actually people's behaviours are much more likely to change if they're compelled to interact with, with the system and with the display. So, what is the future for smart energy meters? Now, I, I come from a health technology background, but what I'd like to end on is something not controversial, but something we can think about for the, the final um, Q&A later on. I think we're all agreed that there's definite potential for, for smart meters, and, and, and it might empower us, give us more control over our consumption, and give us a better idea of how we can make sensible choices about what energy we consume. What I think might unlock the market, however, is looking at how that can be used more globally. For instance, having a smart meter in your house that can let you track health-related things, energy-related things, friends and family-related things, and we could have a hub that unlocks smarter choices overall. And I'll leave you with that thought in the interest of time.